I started in June of 2019, and since we met last, I basically completely changed the way I manage the upper two thirds of the nose, both wow. from reduction of the dorsal hump yeah. as well as to augmentation yeah. of the, uh, the dorsum. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season three and we're doing live face-to-face -face interviews. I'm coming to you from Berlin. We're at the Global Masters meeting and it's really great to be able to catch up with people that I haven't seen in a long time. And one of the people is my guest for today's episode and it's a huge, huge honor for me to have Prof. Dean Turiomi on the show today. Prof. Dean, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure to be here, Cameron. So it's been, a, it's been almost coming up three years since we last did a podcast interview. So much has changed in the world of rhinoplasty. I'm really interested to hear what are your thoughts because I know, I mean, your book came out and then you had to um, change that a little bit now with the, the movement of preservation, etc. And I love listening to you at all these conferences and seeing that even towards the kind of the end the part of your career, you've got a long way to go, but they, that you're still able to change, which is quite an unusual thing because a lot of surgeons, I think, just kind of get set in their way. So I'm very interested to know what your thoughts are with where rhinoplasty is at the moment. Well, I'm 64, I'll be 65 in two months, and I've been practicing for 34 years. And for me, um, I'm always looking for ways to make my results better and basically have better outcomes. And I was having some issues with the mid vault and the nasal bones. Everything was great in the tip. And it always bothered me. And I, when a patient would come in three, five years, 10 years post-op, I've already be thinking in my mind, it's probably mid vault or dorsum. Yeah. And so that really got on my got on my mind all the time. And so when dorsal preservation came around, that opportunity to preserve all that, mm. to preserve the upper two thirds, I saw it as a huge opportunity. So I started in June of 2019. And since we met last, I basically completely changed the way I manage the upper two thirds of the nose, both wow. from reduction of the dorsal hump yeah. as well as to augmentation yeah. of the, uh, the dorsum. Because right now, I'm using intermediate level strips in most situations, as well as low strip and deviated mm. septums. I'm using a, a letdown type of technique. And then I'm using a push up with rib cartilage for uh, ethnic patients, black, yes. Asian yes. patients. Yes. And I'm loving it. I'm actually, I'm, I'm really loving it. Yeah, because about uh, just over a year ago, I came and spent a week with you, and it was so formative being able to just be with you in the OR and see. The biggest takeaway for me was how you've been able to, like the preservation tools can be used in what was previously maybe considered, no, that's an open structural rhinoplasty. Well, I still use structure, all the same structure yeah. techniques in the lower third in the tip area. Yeah. The only thing that's really changed is how I manage the dorsal hump and then dorsal augmentation. Those okay. have been changed dramatically. So, you know, if you look at my book in its entirety, basically only one and a half chapters have changed the mid vault management and the bony vault management. Wow. And so the rest is the same, but you know, in our app, we have a lot on dorsal preservation. Yeah. And I think as people become more comfortable with the bone cuts and are able to, um, you know, navigate around yeah, the yeah. different subdorsal septal techniques, I think they'll find that it has great utility. Yeah. So for the listeners out there, I don't know if you guys are aware that, um, the book also has an app. Maybe you want to tell them a little bit more about that. Yeah, so the app is basically all the multi, um, you know, the, the audio visual stuff, you yeah. know, the multimedia. So it's all the videos are in there. And there's hundreds and hundreds of videos basically on full cases, you know, condensed down to like 20, 25 minutes okay. or different select videos of different cases. Yeah. So it's a it's just a bunch of really, really helpful information that you can watch on your iPad, your iPhone, or your Android. And how can the listeners get hold of that? Well, you have to get the book. So you have to get the book, and then you can download and, that. And, and that book is, is available through? Through uh, toriomirhinoplastybook.com. So then you've got it, toriomirhinoplastybook.com. So make sure that you get it. It's amazing. You can actually put it next to your bed at night and read it. It's so good. <laughs> 
So, Prof, another another area I wanted to explore a bit with you is, so you're turning 65. How do you handle the resilience? Is it because you're now a proud grandfather of a grandson that keeps you young? But where I'm trying to get to in this is that I think a lot of the time as, as, as surgeons, we're so focused on our outcomes and so focused on our patients that we neglect our own health. Well, it's true. I have uh, my grandson, Louis Jack, Fragman and he's I love him and he's a great little guy he's 13 and a half months old and so I want to be around for a while yeah so you know part of that as well as being able to do these four or five six hour cases yeah is to keep my body in tip-top shape yeah so there are three prongs to that one is uh, diet mm -hmm. another is exercise mm -hmm. and the other is stress management yeah those are all three prongs that yeah. are most important. The whole stress situation, I think it helps to do exercise, spend time with my family, my wife, my kids, my grandson. Yeah, That all helps. Um, but the exercise component is very important. So I exercise every morning. I get up around 3.20 in the morning. And I yeah. exercise for about an hour and a half. On weekends, I do a little bit longer. I do about 40 minutes on the treadmill. Yeah. I do core. I do weights. Um, and that gets me going in the morning. That's that brilliant. gets gets me gets yeah. the endorphins yeah. going. Yeah. Gets the cortisol out. Yeah. I do my uh, protein shake um, with while I'm on the treadmill. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the core thing is very important too because you know we're kind of leaning over. We're working on these surgeries. They're yeah. long. If you don't have a strong core, it's things will break down. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we don't want is things to break down. Yeah. You know, you get disc problems, you get problems in your cervical spine. So that's why doing really good core exercises, planks, all that kind of stuff, sit-ups, planks, you know, um, all that is very important yes, to yes, maintaining yes. Um, your, and, your core. And a question there, I'm going to carry on talking about that, but I, I notice also in the OR, you do move around quite a lot. Because yes. I think one of the things that can happen is if you're just stuck statically in one place, it, it can also, it's, a, it's a not good for your body. Right. Yeah. yeah, I move to the head of bed a lot. I go to yeah. the other side of the table. Yeah. Uh, but the view from the head of the bed gives you a much different perspective. Yeah. So I frequently will go to the head of the bed, take a look, because I want to make sure everything's in alignment. And then we'll do t take, a, take a look across the table to see what the profile mm -hmm. looks like. And then we'll even go down a little lower to take a look at the base. I mean, you want to get, yeah. you want to see all the different Absolutely. views of the nose during surgery. So, so <clears throat> if you waking up at 20 past three in the mornings and doing the exercise, Surely you need to get to bed relatively early because sleep is such an important part of our recovery. Right. Yeah. Right. I go to bed typically around 8 p.m. Yeah. And um, by getting a good seven hours of sleep in, I think it's really helpful for, you know, just maintaining a good sleep pattern. Yeah. That's why it's hard for me when I travel because I'm on a, such a very regimented pattern. I get up at 3.20 in the morning without an alarm. Yeah. So, you know, when I travel, because my, you know, melatonin and all that is yeah. kind of worked into a certain schedule, yeah. it's hard when that changes. Yeah. And so that's why it is difficult when I travel. We'll, we'll have to get you to a safari because that might help with the traveling one day. <laughs> Prof, another question. So, so the first one was just stress management. The second part was exercise. But the third part is diet and food. Yes. I know we, we did briefly speak about it a few years ago when you brought out the book during COVID. Tell us a little bit more. How's that gone? How are the book sales going? And then what is the whole philosophy behind it? Because I know you actually did a podcast with Rod a few weeks ago about it as well, mm -hmm. but this is a different type of uh, audience in a way. Right. Yeah. So the diet is critical because what you eat and what you drink is the fuel that propels your body. Yeah. Um, if you have bad food, and inflammatory foods, and it's going to affect you in a negative way. Yeah. So I believe very strongly in a in an anti-inflammatory diet. Yeah. So there's uh, neutral foods, there's inflammatory foods, and then there's anti-inflammatory foods. So basically, in a nutshell, the anti-inflammatory foods are going to be, uh, or the inflammatory foods are going to be sugars and simple carbs, pasta, bread, rice, potatoes, 100%. all that stuff. Yeah. And you know. We go to these dinners and everyone's eating, you know, the masses are eating. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, and, yeah. and so that's inflammatory. <clears throat> now, 
if you can eliminate the simple carb sugars and dairy, and you can focus on anti-inflammatory foods, mm -hmm. which are complex carbs, clean proteins. Um, I mean, if you want to do a, a clean keto, that's an option as well. Yeah. Then I think your body's going to work better because you're you have better fuel. Yeah, it's going to improve your any type of inflammation in your joints and your back. And the other thing it's going to do, I think it helps with longevity. I really believe it. Your that's skin's good. better. Everything's better. Hundred percent. No, I mean, and because I think it's so important that when people get into this rhinoplasty thing, they want to be really good, but they've got to look long time. I mean, thirty-five years of doing this, and you're looking fantastic. Talks are funny. Talks are brilliant. That's great. Well, well, the other part where the anti-inflammatory diet is yeah. important is we give my book to all the patients. Wow. And we tell them to go on the diet for a month, and I know a very significant change. They have wow. less redness, less erythema, um, less edema, all this stuff post-op and they feel better. Yeah. And when you feel better, I think recovery goes smoother. Yeah. And because most people after they have surgery, they go to comfort foods, which are yeah. inflammatory typically. And yeah, so yeah, we yeah, want absolutely. them to stay away from that. Wow. We really advocate matcha. And by starting really that a month before, by then they're more into the habit. Well, we want them to do it a month after. A month after. But you can start maybe a week before, but you really want to be on it for a month post-op. That's post fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, so last little thing, like the listeners know about you. I mean, you, you're absolutely doing a rhinoplasty in the world. But I don't know if they actually know that there's something that you're a little bit more passionate about than rhinoplasty, which is kind of unusual because uh, you absolutely, this is your life in a way, but apparently you quite like fishing. Yes. Yeah. I like fishing quite a bit. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your fishing. Maybe even a fishing story about how big some of those fish are that you catch. Yeah. So fishing to me, particularly like fly fishing and fishing in general, yeah. um, it's a technique execution type um, thing that you're doing. Yes. So you have to execute. Yes. It's not like just dropping you know, a worm in the pond and then having it bite. I mean, you yes. can do that, but yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm more into the casting, okay. you know, the fly fishing. So yes. it's very technique oriented. If you can make your bait look like an actual yeah. uh, predator, you know, something that a predator is going to go yes, after, yes, fish yes, is yes. going to go after, then they're more likely to bite. And so I really enjoy fishing. I fish for primarily largemouth bass when yeah. I'm at home. Okay. And, um, uh, but I have, uh, have, I've had an opportunity to fish in very unique places. I've fished yeah. in the Amazon wow. in, uh, in South America. Yeah. And I fished in, uh, I went fly fishing um, in, in Patagonia, which was wow. really amazing. I caught a huge brown trout. So it was a really amazing experience. Yeah. And do you tie your own flies? Um, I have, but I'm not, you know, very efficient at it. Yeah. But it's something that I plan to do in the future a little bit more. And, and little Louie, does he have a fishing rod yet? He doesn't, but we're, he's ready. To, well, he'll be ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Prof, thank you so much. I mean, it's a super busy schedule here in Berlin. And on behalf of the listeners, I just want to say thank you so much for what you do for all of us around the world and inspiring us. And guys, make sure you get both those books. I cannot encourage you enough. They are absolutely brilliant. Um, and thank you so much for listening again. And we'll... Chat to you guys again next week.